10 miles outside of Gallup, New Mexico, on the outskirts of the Navajo Reservation, is tiny church rock, a patchwork of privately owned property and land belonging to the Navajos. They have lived on this land for hundreds of years. Many are farmers or ranchers. It's the largest U.S. population without electricity, and the people here live closer to the land. It is sacred ground, but it is also where they work and where they play. And for more than 30 years, something here has been very wrong. The way the land looks right now versus the, the way the land used to look in 1968 is completely different. So the grass is gone, the trees gone, all the birds are gone. My name is Teddy Nez. Um, I've been living in this area since uh, 1968. I never did work in a mine. I just live around the mine waste. And I'm actually from Tuba City area. And due to my wife uh, living here, I live here with my children. They share one home, the children and the grandchildren. His wife's family has lived here for seven generations. And in this large family, cancer has almost become an expectation. My brothers and sisters, uh, through my wife, uh, they, they have cancer. They have gone through uh, chemotherapy and uh, all the others. And then uh, the other ones, uh, they have cancers, but uh, they have uh, taken the road of the traditional way, just like the way I did. Traditional here means ancient Navajo medicine. That's what Teddy Nez used when he was diagnosed with colon cancer at a VA hospital after he got back from Vietnam. <laughs> Down the road, it's a similar story. Well, for myself, I've gone through uh, lymphoma, gone through chemotherapy, and I, I'm like sort of still struggling with my health. My name is Edith Hood, and I've lived here in this community most of my life. Her father had pulmonary fibrosis, and her mother had colon cancer. The cause of their diseases is hard to prove, but many people here think it goes back more than half a century. First it was the exploratory drilling that came in. We were just kids like my grandchildren here at the time, so we had really no, no uh, idea of what they were doing and we weren't informed. Recently, vast deposits of uranium have been discovered in the Navajo Hills. Well, uranium mining really came to Church Rock in 1950, 1951. Uh, there were small mines that were um, located up on the top of mesas where the uh, uranium-bearing rock formation would come to the surface. The U.S. government's atomic bomb program drove demand for uranium in Church Rock, the industry grew, and as mines went deeper into the ground, larger companies came in. Really, the 1970s and into the early 80s were the big ticket production time in the Church Rock area. At the heyday of the operation of the three big mines, uh, the Northeast Church Rock mine, the Church Rock One mine across the Arroyo, and the old Church Rock mine, there were, and then the uranium mill, the United Nuclear Corporation uranium mill that was built in 74, 75, and 76, uh, there were upwards of 950 people working. All of that changed early in the morning of July 16th, 1979. Well, to me, it was kind of like, oh no, you know, it happened. So we drove to work one day and there was this big void and I looked at it and I said, oh, you know, when the day shift came on, I started hearing people saying, did you, hear, did you see the dam? Did you see the mill site? Did you see that break? I didn't know what they were talking about until when I got off work and I was headed back down at two, two in the afternoon that I, I glanced over to the mill site um, and I saw a huge gaping hole in the dam. And it, it, it was a terrible sight. A dam holding back 93 million gallons of radioactive sludge had burst. Liquid with the corrosive power of battery acid drained into a nearby stream bed, killing crops and livestock, burning the skin of those who touched it. It still is the uh, largest release by volume of radioactive materials ever in the U.S. 
And in terms of radiation, it was second only to Chernobyl until Fukushima. It was something that we knew that was going to happen. They knew that was going to happen. It was just be careful. Why didn't anybody do anything? Why didn't they? That's what we asked today. Um, I don't know. Um, like I said in the beginning, it was about money. It was pr about production. Um, we always did enough, just enough to get by. Um, same, just on anything we did, whether it be clean up, or it didn't matter what it was. We did just enough. The 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 people from the administration, I guess you could say, the the bosses. We did just enough to keep the inspectors that came in, or to keep everybody happy. So it was all about just production, production, production. production. That was the goal: get the uranium out of the ground, get it processed and have it available to put into bombs, essentially. The mill was closed in the early 80s, and the uh, site was designated as a Superfund site. It was added to the national priority list in uh, the early 80s. Because of these three uh, areas of off-site groundwater contamination, so that's uh, a 27-year-old story of uh, since the Superfund designation was first issued. After mining stopped, the companies left behind a legacy of radioactive waste. Those who know the area believe the process of cleaning up or reclamation was inadequate at best, and at worst, negligent. There's a tremendous amount of impact that still exists and in that day and age. There weren't requirements for any kind of reclamation. There were no requirements for uh, monitoring environmental releases, and there certainly were no requirements for protecting the health of the people who live around there. The cleanup itself was done very poor. Um, it wasn't, there was no care taken. Um, the trash that was already there was left there. Um, it was just covered. The toxins dumped into the stream bed in 1979 are only part of the story. Radioactive rock piles still dot the area, contaminated equipment and buildings remain, and beneath the ponds used to store the mine waste, there were no liners, so toxins seeped into the ground. The tailings were put into a location where there was groundwater, and the tailings were uh, wet, half liquid, half solid, and they soaked in through the sand and uh, reached the aquifer and spread from beneath the tailings pile in uh, three directions, uh, due north uh, into Navajo land, uh, due east, and then further south under the area where the spill occurred. The contaminants are still there. So whenever it rains and uh, the water soaks into the ground, you, you, still, you still got that uh, con contamination on the ground. So it's a lot closer, it's still there. The Environmental Protection Agency has done some work here in recent years, including removing the radioactive topsoil in a 100-foot radius around Teddy Nez's house. But residents and researchers say the process has been too slow, and even when it's done, the current plan won't take the waste out of the community. It will just move it a little farther away. The cleanup isn't cheap, and the costs are high in every way. The EPA told Teddy Nez not to go outside for more than one hour at any one time to reduce his exposure. He's more vulnerable because of his age and previous experience with cancer, but he knows it can't be good for his grandchildren. When the children walk to the bus stop, they pick up the mud, and the bus would drive through here, they pick up mud in the contaminated area. So the students get on the bus with the muddy feet, and then they drop the mud on the floor and then kids, uh, after it dries, kids will be running back and forth and uh, all that goes into the air and then the, some on the seat and then on their clothing. So in that way, when they go to the, uh, um, the school, when they get off the bus and then they walk into the classroom where they have carpet, 
to the snow drop uh, mud and all that in that area and then uh, that way uh, the exposure continues uh, not only here but in the classroom. Teddy Nez's concerns for his grandchildren are grounded in science. The EPA and other groups found there are still dangerous levels of radiation throughout Church Rock and although it cleared some soil around Teddy Nez's house the whole area is so contaminated that radiation is blown back in. I just worry about the waste pile. I said, no, when it rains, erosion works there, and whatever may be there is coming back down, maybe into the ditches off of there, into the plants itself. And then they're working with the land on this side, so when the wind blows, you don't know which way the wind is blowing. Some of that may be uh, the soil that's been affected. You don't know which way it's blowing, so I'll worry about the young children, the, our grandchildren. If we looked at how far each person was from the sum of all of those mines and weighted it by the surface area of the minor waste site, that alone was predictive of kidney disease, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease, as well as autoimmune disease. Dr. Johnny Lewis is a professor at the University of New Mexico, and although residents of Church Rock have been trying to get money to fund health research for decades, her study is the first of its kind in the area. You do increase your risk of disease by living um, in these areas and interacting with the waste in any of the ways that we looked at. There's a certain risk of just living there, and then if you had one way that you interacted, we had about six different ways that we asked people about. So if you had one of those, say you walked across the tailings pile with your, or the waste pile, the edge of it with your animal, your horse, whatever, or you herded your livestock or one of those behaviors. If you did only one, the increase might be a 50% increase in your likelihood of getting that disease. If you did two of them, it's another 50% over that risk that you had from one behavior. It just is sort of sad when you think about it. And, well, in, in the Indian way of life, you know, we're all connected with the earth. We have prayers for it and like I said, it provides with us with a lot of things. And it's just sad to see what has happened, the aftermath of the mining, the landscape, you know, the plants. Now that you know what's there, what's the danger that they left there. Now, as they're only starting to understand the extent of the danger, the people of Church Rock are fighting another battle. Uranium prices have more than quadrupled in the last 10 years, and the mining companies are back. It's a very unequal playing field. And, and, you, and you combine that with the fact that these people are generally also fighting their government, their federal government uh, and state government, which has you know taxpayer uh, resources at their disposal. Uh, it becomes even more uh, astonishing that, that uh, there's resistance at all. Eric Jantz has represented the Navajo in court for more than a decade in a fight against Hydro Resources Incorporated, an offshoot of the mining company Uranium Resources Incorporated. They wanted to stop the mine. And two years ago, in March, they lost. Oh, it was crushing. I mean, it was, it was horrible. Uh, for me, uh, it, was, it was personally uh, tremendously disappointing uh, because, you know, the amount of work that I put in to it. And it was because, you know, this case has been a, a part of my life for, you know, almost a decade and a half now. But for the, for the clients, it was, I mean, it was really devastating. In a phone interview, Matt Loueras, a spokesman for URI, said, we are very confident in the in-situ recovery technology that we've utilized. Over the last 30 years, we've really come to perfect that process. It's not perfect, but we're always working on it to make sure that it's getting better. 
<clears throat> and while the two sides disagree about how clean the water is today at the new mine site, both agree that groundwater can never be restored to the same state after in situ recovery mining. Your best bet is to stay far away, which is a problem for Larry King, whose property is just across the road from the proposed mine. I started thinking about it more and more. And now it's just like daily I look out there and I and I just look at the, uh, look look at the site, and I try to remember as much as I can. Try to keep that on my mind, the natural beauty of the landscape back there, where the proposed HRI site is. So it's constantly on my mind now, day in and day out. Because there is something very valuable in this place that seems to have so little, the mining will start again. The only certain way to escape the toxins is to move away, but for reasons that most of us can't quite understand, these people, the Navajo, see themselves as connected to the land itself, and they will not leave. Their attachment to the land is stronger than the logic of the situation, and the conclusion is inevitable that whatever the risks, whatever the dangers, they will live here and die here.